Sorry, Sorry Scott. Scott. Scott, I'm going to open on you. Paul, you're going to come over here. here. I understand. I'm trying to get two dual screens. Yes. Uh, let's try this over here. Just this over here. Paul, do not start the show, Paul. Hey, Scott. How's it going? <laughs> Paul, have you started, Paul, the, have show you started the show? Go ahead, Scott. Scott. Yep. Yeah. Have we started? Anyways, have we started? Hey, everyone. This is uh, Scott Roberts from Explore um, Explore Scientific, and you are watching uh, yet another episode of On the Wing. Um, we have uh, Kent Martz and Annie Scarborough with us today, um, but uh, Kent is uh, uh, with us uh, to show us some of the uh, viewer submissions that have been sent in from uh, viewers just like you. Um, <laughs> I hope that the public broadcasting stations don't uh, get angry at me for using that little term. Anyways, um, it's been really cool, though, to have uh, viewers send in their uh, birdie photography I told you photographs. Man. We've had some really great ones turned in. And um, uh, uh, anyhow, um, are we ready to show some of that stuff at this time? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Getting closer. Getting closer. All right. No problem. No problem. Well, let's have Annie come on uh, with us and talk a little bit about Explore Alliance. Annie, take it away. <laughs> hey guys, um, I'm just here to talk a little bit about the Explore Alliance and what's going on with it. Um, <clears throat> we have some exciting things coming up. Um, we, um, Scott and I sat down and talked about some um, specials that we're gonna be offering um, our Platinum members. Um, so in the next week, you're probably going to get some information on that. Um, we have quite a few things that are heading up on the calendar um, coming really soon, like um, the Arizona Dark Sky um, Party and um, quite a few other things. I don't have a calendar in front of me. but um, And then, of course, we have, um, I, if you've been on our calendar, you'll probably see that we have, um, it's called Explore Now or Explore Alliance Now. Um, that is our Facebook um, preview that we do for our Amazon Live. We do that every day at 1.30, so that's a new show that we have coming up. Um, we also have um, uh, the, the Alliance um, shows. I think, they're, I think we're going to end up having 19 by the end of the year, so um, those are once a month. And then, of course, our regular shows like um, On the Wing with Kent and Astrophotog uh, Focus on Astrophotography with Tyler and um, things like that throughout the week. So keep uh, paying attention to that calendar. You'll see some updates going on to that. Um, we are getting closer to getting um, all the certificates out to everybody. Um, I've already used over, I've already used all my stickers, so we're um, in the process of making more so we can get those certificates out to everybody. So I apologize for the delay in that. Um, but we have a lot of uh, fun, exciting things coming up. Um, you know, being a part of the alliance has many great benefits. Um, not only do you get a $100 gift card back when you join plat for the Platinum membership, um, that's $99 a year, a year um, mm -hmm. but you get to use that towards product um, here at, on our website or in the store if you come in the store, um, but you get VIP access and you get uh, to events and discounts and dibs on new product. So um, I just want to uh, just kind of tell you guys that there's some, there's some amazing benefits to the Alliance, um, you know, 
we are all about education here and so um, we want to try to help promote um, whoever in that so great scott got any questions uh, she might be able to hear you can you say something scott Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm just hear? excited about some of the new stuff that's coming up next week. Do um, you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I've got okay, you. all right. Okay, so um, I uh, Paul's just got the camera just on me right now, uh, but uh, uh, I know that everybody wanted to say hello to you. Um, uh, let's I don't have any questions right now, except that I know that uh, we have some exciting stuff coming up for Explorer Alliance members next next week. And so you're going to want to watch the show. Uh, you're going to find some fantastic uh, offers uh, that uh, you'll find nowhere else. So uh, that's very cool. Um, we have uh, Mike Wiesner watching. He wanted to know if we were still live. Uh, of course, we're live here. And uh, Pekka's on, howdy everybody, and Gooder Thursday. Um, and uh, uh, better, uh, Pekka said, or do you say better? Better Thursday or Gooder? Better. More Gooder. <laughs> More Gooder <laughs> or better. That's right. And Norm Hughes says, happy Thursday. And Martin Eastburn says, I muted Scott. So anyhow, hopefully you guys can hear us okay out there. Um, are we uh, are we ready to, to start at this point? Yeah, we are. So any can okay. take off. I'll see y'all later. Bye, Annie. All right. Bye. All right. So here we go on the wing. Of course, it worked just a second ago. There we go. So this is not showing. The bottom of the screen, Paul. Nope, you're missing the part where it says it's from who took it. This is an Osprey taken by Jason Janes in, I believe, Lake Payson, Arizona. Having to remember this stuff. So here we go. Let's listen to the call of the Osprey. Can you hear it? I can hear it. Can you hear it, Scott? No. Scott can't hear it. All right. But that doesn't mean that our audience isn't here. Does our audience hear the bird call? Give him a chance to answer. Do y'all hear the birds? Yeah. The bird. Pekka, can you, no sound, Mike says. No sound. Okay. So the Osprey is 21 to 23 inches uh, with a wingspan of astounding seven inches. Uh, Osprey are large, distinctive birds. Uh, they are hawks. And despite their size, their bodies are cylinder with long, narrow wings and long legs. Ospreys fly with marked kinks in their wings, making an M-shaped when seen from below. Marked the birds... Kink. What do you mean sir? by that? You They're sort of like kink. this. They have a kink in their length. Oh, okay. See, like right the, there in the picture. Angle. Okay. Yeah, That's see the how they're... Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, eagles Man, have I, very... I I would not want to see one of these things coming at my face or something, you know. No, um, no, that not thing at all. Would do damage. <laughs> yep, they, yeah, they do damage very badly. So you're uh -huh. looking at the, the map, uh, most of North America, uh, with breeding migration, wintering in year round. So we see osprey here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, a couple of years ago, was fishing. Uh, with my sons uh, kayak fishing and an osprey mm -hmm. hit the water about 100 feet away and we didn't really see it coming just saw the giant splash and right. it did not come up with a fish so but it was very cool to see all right so 
they, they fly very fast? Uh, they die fast. Uh, they uh, fly along like any hawk, you know, looking, and then they just tip over into a dive and flare out into like this picture you see. And we have more of uh, the sequence of this hawk, uh, osprey, catching a fish. So let's talk about it a little bit more. Okay. Ospreys. Go ahead, Scott. I said okay. Okay. The problem is, Scott, I'm getting a triple echo, and it makes it harder to hear anything. Okay. All right. Os I hear myself triple echo. All right. Ospreys are brown above and white below, and overall they're whiter than most raptors. From below, the wings are mostly white with a prominent dark patch at the wrists, as you can see here in the photo. The head is white with a broad brown stripe through the eye. Can't mm -hmm. really see it here. Uh, juveniles have white spots on the back of their buffy shading and buffy shading on the breast. They search for fish by flying on steady wing beats, uh, bowed wings, or circling high above the sky uh, over rel relatively open, shallow, water. Uh, they often hover brief, uh, briefly during, boy this is hard to talk and hear yourself so late. Uh, they obviously dive feet first to grab the fish. You can see it's outspread talons and we'll see it here in a minute as it carries the birds can, away. Why don't you do yourself a favor and just pull your earphones off and just hang them around your neck. That's an idea. Get... Let's see. How's that? Okay. Boy, that, that's going to be better right there. All right. Yeah, there you go. Uh, ospreys caught, caught in, in studies, uh, ospreys have caught fish in, in sometimes one of every four dives with success rates topping 70%. The average time they spent hunting before making a catch was about mm -hmm. 12 minutes, uh, which is, you know, frankly, something to think about. Next time you go fishing and throw a line in the water and see if you catch something every 12 minutes. Nice. Uh, sometimes it happens, but most times it doesn't. Uh, these hawks do very well around humans and have rebounded significantly uh, following the ban of DDT in the 1970s. Mm. For those of you not old enough to know or don't remember, DDT was a pesticide used widely uh, and is frankly credited with... Uh, Eliminated, eliminated malaria carrying mosquitoes from the United States, but it also caused uh, uh, the top predators of the food chain to have, if, if I remember correctly, thin eggshells, uh, which caused the shells to not, the eggs to not hatch, they would get broken in the nest, and sent raptors into perilous decline. Uh, and if you live near water where osprey are around, consider putting up a nest platform to attract breeding pairs you can find directions on how to do this on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find them uh, around any bodies of water, salt marshes, rivers, ponds, reservoirs, estuaries, and even around coral reefs. Uh, their conspicuous stick nests are placed in open on poles, gentle markers, and dead trees, often over water. Scientists, I found this interesting, scientists have been tracking the birds with, uh, in migration for years with uh, small transmitters. Uh, and in 2018, one osprey threw, flew 2,700 miles in 13 days. They flew from Martha's Vineyard, uh, Massachusetts, to French Guiana in South America. So let me see if we can get back up here on the PowerPoint. And let's go through this series of feet photos that have, uh, um, that were taken by, uh, Weird that his name's not showing up, but Jason James. Here we go. There we go. So there it is. Talon's almost on the water, in the water, out of the water with a what looks like a bass of some measure, and repositioning, getting its hooks into it. And like Scott said, that's really not something you want to see coming at you if you're fish like that. And then there's a great shot of it. Uh, flying off really shows that brown eye stripe in this picture right here. 
that we talked about in the uh, description of the bird. Moving along to, and I actually took these next pictures. Uh, we talked about the great tail grackle a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we don't have sound. These are very raucous, loud birds. Uh, trills. I can, I can bring some sound in. Find that video with the great tail grackle with the manhole cover and see if you can pump that sound out while I keep talking about it. Tell me when you're ready to go, Paul. Okay. So the great tail grackle uh, is 15. We did this about three weeks ago, but I'm going to do it again because, you know, I got a picture of it, so why not? Uh, and we're going to look at the, uh, the, the range difference between the two types of grackles, the great tailed and the boat tailed. These are a songbird. They have uh, slightly smaller than a crow, but weigh far less. A uh, male's tapered tail is long, as long as his body and folds into a distinct V or keel, K-E-E-L shape. Females are about half the size of the males with long slender, tail, slender tails, and they're a gray-brown color. The males are iridescent black with a piercing yellow eye, and they have a black bill and legs. Uh, females, as I said, are darker brown above, paler below, with a buff-colored throat and stripes above the eye. Uh, you'll see great-tailed grackles uh, flocking with other blackbirds, pecking for food on lawns. Sir, you got it? Okay, here we go. Here comes the sound. That sound is crazy. down in Texas we heard of those guys like constantly. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so there you go. Those crazy whistles and trills and whirls and just you know almost sounds like a police car or something. Just a crazy sound. And you can see the range here, uh, ranges along the, the Gulf Coast and really spreads up into the heartland of uh, Middle America. And we actually do have these birds here, although not uh, in the, pro the numbers that we had down in Texas when we were at Fort Worth Camera a few years ago. Uh, in 1900, the northern edge of the Great Tail Grackles Range barely reached into southern Texas. However, since the 1960s, uh, they've been following the spread of irrigation agriculture uh, and urban development into the Great Plains in the west. And today, they are considered to be one of North America's fastest expanding species of bird. Uh, they're all over the place, uh, rural areas, public areas, parks, cemeteries, parking lots. They were all over the place down in Texas where I took this picture uh, in a tree uh, at a store we're at. So uh, they often uh, will wade into water and grab fish and frogs, although grain and other uh, feedstuffs on land are their uh, great uh, food supply. Uh, the great tail and boat tailed trackles have at times been considered the same species. However, uh, they are now considered closely related but different species. Let me show you this slide real quick. There's a slide showing the range of the great tailed crackle on, I keep saying crackle, I feel like I'm saying crackle, grackle on the right versus the boat tailed grackle on the left. You know, it's a, uh, you know, I think the science is not settled ultimately on whether they're the same species or a different species. So, and let me get, get um, go on to the next species. The next species, Paul, is going to be the uh, Eurasian collared dove. So you can start looking for that video. Okay, so the video is ready to go. Scott, uh, why don't you do some... Uh, shout outs to the people who are listening right now. Any questions they have so far? Scott? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah, it's, 
first one to log on was uh, Mike Wiesner, um, of course, Pekka and Norm Hughes, uh, Martin Eastburn's on, Sintil Nagapan's on. Um, uh, let's see. We have, um, I don't see Beatrice on today. There's a couple of others that are not logging in today, so out of our normal group, but uh, Martin Eastburn says, uh, and I think he's talking about um, uh, the grackles, he says they are a bit nasty as well around people, possessive, I believe. You know, uh, birds definitely have emotions, <laughs> um, and um, uh, they, they definitely are, um, uh, you know, we have, uh, my wife has a couple of parrots, and the female parrot is an extremely jealous bird, so... Pretty crazy, but um, so so. How does she uh, uh, How does she express her uh, affection and her jealousy into whom? Well, with her affection towards uh, uh, the bird, bird she's mated to, uh, you know, I mean, they nuzzle up against each other. Uh, the male will feed her. Uh, similar to like a how a bird feeds baby chicks by regurgitating food directly into her mouth, which is kind of gross. Um, but uh, uh, the um, uh, I think the thing that's really uh, pretty cool is um, you know it just uh, the kind of cooing and 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 exchange of bird calls that they'll do to each other. Uh, on the other, on the flip side, uh, when the bird's jealous, uh, she will actually attack people that she is jealous over. Okay, and so you know, in the case of parrots, they mate with uh, their owners. Okay, they don't become pets. Uh, they are. They actually go through a mating. Uh, uh, you know, that, that's how they're thinking in their mind. Uh, that uh, uh, this is. This is uh, this is my mate. You're you're getting in the way, and uh, so they they will uh, they'll attack. They'll bite um, uh, these kinds of things. So that that's in the case of parrots. I I'm just kind of taking it as a takeaway that other birds probably get jealous, you know, uh, and possessive. You know, you and think? I suspect they have their own personalities. Like you can just look at this picture, of this grackle that's up. And he was like 10 feet from me, and he was fearless and stood there and looked at me and then started sort of uh, walking away. And it, it looked like he was almost strutting, saying, yeah, I'm moving, but I'm a big old grackle. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> All right, yeah. so okay. let's go on to, if I can get my mouse up there. There we go. This is a... Eurasian collar dove, also taken in Fort Worth, Texas. This was across the parking lot. Uh, we had seen another dove earlier and in a tree, and it flew off before I was able to get a, a picture of it. Uh, and I, it, I actually, I think it was a white-winged dove because that's what it looked like, and I couldn't get to the binoculars. So um, I went on, and uh, we saw this other one a little while later, and I got a picture of it hoping it was going to be a white-winged, because it would be my first uh, life list of a white-winged dove, and I was not able to um, uh, get a picture of it to find out whether it really was or not. And it teaches me a lesson of, you know, keep your binoculars uh, on top of the pile of telescopes you've taken to it and binoculars you've taken to a show, not underneath uh, the big pile where you can't get to them. Let's see. With the pause, that's a little bit, no, but still behind. It's, it's just a single echo now. That's better. All right, so let me get up here, find my notes, and they're gone. There we go. All right, Eurasian collar doves. Uh, they're a plump bird, uh, small head, long tails, and they're larger than the standard morning doves that most of us are familiar with, uh, but bigger, uh, excuse me, slimmer and longer tail than a rock pigeon. Uh, wings are broad, slightly rounded. 
the broad tail is squared off at the tip uh, rather than being a pointy or a pointed like a morning dove's tail. The Eurasian collared dove is an invasive species uh, because uh, back in the 70s, a few Eurasian collared doves were introduced in the Bahamas and they have now made their way to Florida by the 1980s and then rapidly colonized most of North America. Uh, people have helped make the Eurasian dollar covered home, collared dove at home in North America uh, by uh, uh, bird feeders and trees planted in urban areas are cited as two of the main factors in the species colonization of the continent. Well, you know, planting trees in suburban areas, I mean, that's just planting trees. I'm not sure how that helped or didn't help. All right, Paul, play the Eurasian collared dove for us. He sounds like most doves do to me. Yes. Can you hear that? We can hear it, Paul. I can hear it. I can hear it too. Okay, that's not a dove. That did, like you, did you hear that squeaking noise? That was the yeah. dove flying off. It's, it's clearly a dove sound, but it's yeah. faster than the morning dove, and they're more of a hoo-hoo-hoo. Yeah. I have a question for you. I, I've heard that these birds uh, were considered uh, to be a pest because they carry disease. Is that right? All birds carry disease. I mean, it's just no more than any others. I know Arkansas has a dove hunting season. Okay. And most other states do too. And there's a limit, per day limit, on the morning dove, but you can kill as many collared doves as you want to. There's no limit. Huh. You know, my because like, they're an invasive you species. After... What'd you say, Scott? <laughs> Hit the wrong button. <laughs> yeah. We've got some, some guy with a six pack uh, stomach. There. <laughs> Not anymore. He's gone. Oh, I goodness. I don't know what kind of bird that is. I, I, didn't, I didn't touch any button. It, it, it went to an ad on us when I wasn't paying yes. attention. Yep. <laughs> okay, so the Euro, I was to Eurasian. Do other things. Yeah, he's got a lot of buttons he's going to push. All right, so the Eurasian collar does are a chalky light brown to gray buff with broad white patches in the tail. However, the bird's namesake collar is the most obvious feature that differentiates it. It's a narrow black crescent around the nape of the neck. Uh, it, so think of it as like a horseshoe that goes around the back of its neck. Uh, in flight and when perched, the wingtips are darker than the rest of the body, which we can see here in the picture of the dove which is quite enlarged because the bird was uh, farther away. When I started walking towards it, it sort of started eyeballing me, and I started taking pictures. I'd hoped to get closer, but did not. So Eurasian collared doves perch like other doves on telephone poles, wires, fences, large trees, and they give their incessant Three syllable coo coos, hard to say. Uh, strong flight pattern features burst of clipped wing beats and looping glides. And when walking, these doves bob their heads and flick their tails. Uh, these Eurasian collared doves often feed at backyard seed feeders and on spilled grain in stockyards and around silos. Uh, they live in urban areas, suburban areas throughout much of the U.S., except the Northeast, which we can see here on the map. Uh, it's a very strange to me why they can live up into Canada, but they're not in the Northeastern United States. I find that weird, and I may actually try and do a little research on why that is. Um, I think it may be another species. I don't, uh, you know, there's not, I mean, the morning doves 
you know, and white wing morning doves are ubiquitous in the United States. White wing doves out west, I don't think they're forced out by other species. It's just a, you know, like Dan George has said, birds don't respect the maps that we draw for them. Uh, no. So, as other doves, uh, the parent birds meet the chicks' needs with protein, uh, typically with insects, but doves don't do that. Their newly hatched chicks get a fat, protein-rich crop milk that is a whitish fluid that comes from the liquid-filled cells uh, that slough off the lining of the crop, uh, which is a portion of the esophagus. The crop is where the seeds and, and insects and food get ground up. Uh, but yeah. the, the crop milk is produced and fed to the baby birds. Uh, somewhere between five and ten days, uh, the chicks switch to a diet of regurg regurgitated seeds and fruit, uh, which is what most other birds um, consume as well. Eurasian collared doves are a few species that can drink heads down. Doves typically can do this. Uh, they submerge their bills and suck water through, like up through a drinking straw. Uh, most birds have to scoop water into the bills, tip their heads back, and let the water run down its throat in a gravity assist. So that is the Eurasian collar dove. Scott, do we have any comments? Uh, Pekka says that we have a pair of Eurasian coot. Is a coot and a dove the same thing? Coot? A coot yeah. is a water bird. At least in the United yeah. States. Okay. All right. So Eurasian coots nearby me, and these are really scared of humans. But they're also aggressive to ducks and seagulls. Uh, they run really fast after them if they come too near their nests. The American coot has weird bright green legs, and it looks sort of like a duck on the water. But when they start flying, they have to run, 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 run. And they walk, use their feet to gain speed. Really a weird looking bird. We've uh, talked about the American coot a few times. So, mm -hmm. Pekka, your assignment is to get video or pictures <laughs> of the these old coots. That's exactly yeah. right. All right. So, moving on, the American robin. I suspect Paul is ahead of us here and has the video ready. So we'll use that here in just a minute. Okay. Go to the next slide. Martin Eastburn so, says, birds of prey might take after them like falcons. So this is a video. Let me see if I can get it to go. I've got the video. Not my video. No, not your Sorry, video. we can't play the media in this dad gummit. So this robin is outside of the building. I've the door the you see in the background is uh, the store door to our store here. And this was uh, uh, water that's uh, evacuating off the roof from the air conditioners. And the robin is bathing in the water and uh, will run under the drips. And is, is, it looks almost like it's feeding, but I think it's just running to spots and taking a quick drink. Uh, it's a really cool video, and of course, uh, this way we're running PowerPoint won't let us play the awesome, fantastic, spectacular, stunning wildlife photography by Kent Martz. Yes. <laughs> you know, a little, we can, I can play this stuff if you give me just a second here. Because you had access to the PowerPoint, too. You might be able to extract it's it. It's not through the PowerPoint, unfortunately. That's what I'm saying. You're going to play it a different uh, way. It's true. Yep. So we're giving Paul some, a chance to do that. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the American Robin. We've talked about okay. it before, I don't know, three or four months ago. The American Robin is 8 to 11 inches long, so it's a fairly large bird. It's uh, the largest uh, songbird, uh, or fairly large songbirds, I'm sorry, with go. a round, large round body. Hang on, Paul long legs and a fairly long tail. Robins are the largest North American thrush and their profile offers a good chance to learn the basic shape of most thrushes. So if you see that robin shape, most thrushes uh, are shaped like that. They're a great reference point for comparing the size and shape of other animals, uh, excuse me, other birds as well. Uh, American robins are gray brown birds with large, with excuse me, warm orange underparts and dark heads. Sort of what you can see here. I should, should have 
lighten this a little bit, but uh, if you're in the United States, you know what a robin looks like. In flight, a white patch on the lower belly and tail is conspicuous. Compared with males, females have paler heads that contrast with uh, their less gray backs. And real quick, one other thing, and it will play the video. Western populations are often paler than their eastern populations and have almost no white at the tail corners. Uh, breeding robins on the Canadian Atlantic coast are richly colored with black on the upper back and neck. So, Paul, play this astounding nature video. Don't hear anything, Paul. Oh, there's nothing to hear. Yeah, there is. There's sound with it. Do you want... Now, which one? I was playing the one that you took. Yeah, there's sound with that. It's you can hear birds in the much. background. Okay, no big deal. All right, I mean, so you can it. see what I was doing. Play it one more time. Okay, hang on. Back it up and play it again. No, it's not capturing the sound from the audio. Yeah, it's not the pulling the sound. Okay. That's okay. The video is the best there's part. There's not much sound anyway. So. I think it the was... It's sound. <laughs> there's, there's birds in the background. There's robins, you know, doing their robin thing. Well, I'm screen capturing this rather than having it into yeah. the actual program. If I had it in the program, I could get the audio in. So I, so I was going home when I saw this and saw it doing that. That thought, I'm going to take video of that. And there it flies off. All right, so uh, now go ahead and play the sound for us, Paul. The robin? Okay, we can do that. Let's see here, merge, and play. While you guys are... There you go. And you see that white patch under its rump and the mm -hmm. robin red breast. And there we go. Thank you, Paul. That's a very good reputation of what that bird sounds like. So... Finishing up the notes here, let me scroll down. So often called the quintessential early bird, uh, the American robins are common sites on lawns across, lawns across North America, uh, especially harbingers of spring in many areas where you'll often see them tugging earthworms out of the ground. They have a unique way of walking along, cocking a head to one side and then going after a worm I've sat there and tried to look for worms in the grass, and I'm a human and I can't do it. But robins clearly find worms that are just right there that we can't see. Um, they listen for them and they use their eyes. I have a lot of robins in my yard. Yeah, it's amazing to watch them. I, I sit there and watch them while I'm standing on my porch, and you can see them. They're listening, and then they look. Yeah, it's really cool to watch them and amazing. And I'll go out there and look, and I can't find a worm even digging through the grass, and the robins can find <laughs> them over and over and over again and get fat on them. Uh, so they're popular birds because of their beautiful orange breast and their cheery song, as we heard. And uh, they are often, in many areas, early appearance at the end of winter, which makes them the early bird. Uh, they show up and give us all a hopeful uh, idea that spring may be upon us, although... There's always a cold snap that comes in, and uh, that's okay. Winter is, or summer, spring anyway, is close at hand. Uh, they're familiar all the way across the United States, uh, including mountains, forests, and up into the Alaskan wilderness, up in the provinces and territories of Alaska. You know, they're a ubiquitous North American birds. They're very industrious birds uh, that bound across lawns, stand erect, beak tilted upward to survey, survey their environment. Uh, when alighting, they habitually flick their tails downward several times. You can see this every time they land. In fall and winter, they form large flocks and gather in trees to roost and eat berries. Uh, they generally eat a lot of fruit in the fall and winter. 
uh, and they actually eat the honeysuckle berries exclusively. They sometimes, because they're intoxicated on the honeysuckle berries, because they will ferment, because those berries have so much sugar in them. Scott, I don't think I've ever seen a drunk robin before, but who knows? I've, I've um, seen drunk birds before. I wonder if you could give robin, a robin a breathalyzer test. Probably talking into blowing continuously into the thing would be difficult. Well, it's, it's bigger than its beak. Yeah, it's true. That That is true. So, uh, let's see, common everywhere. Here's something interesting. Uh, American robins uh, successfully produce up to three broods in one year. Uh, on average, though, only 40% of the nests successfully produce young, and only 25% of those fledged, youngs, fledged young survive to November. So their strategy for reproduction is, clearly, try a lot and a few will survive. Uh, yeah. From surviving to November, uh, from that point on, about half of the robins alive in any year will make it to the next year, which means that half the robins die every year is what it sounds like. Uh, despite that, a lucky robin can live to be 14 years old. Uh, however, the entire population turns over on average every six years. That's astounding to me. Uh, robins eat different types of food depending on the time of day. They eat earthworms in the mornings and seek out fruit later in the day. Uh, they forage on lawns. Uh, it makes them very vulnerable to pesticide poisoning and uh, the presence of robins can be an important indicator of chemical population in your yards, chemical pollution if they're not there. Uh, as yeah. I have said before, if you want birds in your yards, you have to really think about the fact that you want yeah, to have want birds in your yard. yard. And yeah. if you want to have birds in your yard, you have to have things that the birds are going to eat. And if it's robins, it's earthworms and other bugs that are in your yard. If you put a lot of pesticides on your yard and kill all you know the hundred different kinds of bugs, you're not going to have a hundred different kinds of birds. So right. you know it's a trade-off. And you know I see these things capture capture all these insects. Well, that's what birds are for. We need to learn to live with a few insects. Now, granted, I don't want mosquitoes around, but I love fireflies. You love fireflies, Scott. I know you love fireflies, Scott. If you like fireflies, you have fireflies. to have leaf litter in your yard for those beetles to live. If you sure. want to have songbirds, you got to have insects for the songbirds they're going to eat. You know, sure. and just putting out feeders is fine for some birds, but many, many species of birds do not eat. Um, if, if you're putting uh, poison seeds. out in your yard, if you're putting poison out in your yard, you are also getting poison whether you're eating it or you're just walking around your yard it, you're getting it okay uh so it's it's also not good for you um and uh you know uh, and more than once i've seen these class action lawsuits you know they, they continue to come out you know for those who ever used whatever you know like roundup in your yard you know we have this class action lawsuit well i think my parents and Everybody in every neighborhood I know, they, they would talk about using Roundup. I didn't even know what Roundup meant when I was a, a little kid, but uh, uh, or a teenager. Did speculate once that DDT hmm. eliminated malaria? No, it did. Uh, ma malaria was endemic in the United States. Boy, I'm getting this double echo. Ma malaria was endemic in the United States, uh, and DDT wiped out. Uh, the mosquitoes that carried malaria, which allowed people to live in the southern United States because, uh, you know, people didn't want to live here because of malaria. In fact, you, uh, a lot of the resorts that uh, got started in the Ozark Mountains and the Appalachians in the summertime were a direct result of people wanting to escape the heat and humidity and the malaria mosquitoes, and they didn't want their kids, family to be the chance of getting malaria. It's, you know, so... Yes, DDT provided a great service for us, but it also nearly killed off, um, you know, many of the high t uh, apex predators, in this case birds, because it made their egg shells so thin. And, you know, my dad says, man, DDT, I can remember my dad spreading DDT in the backyard when we lived in Clarksville, Arkansas, because sure. people were going to come over and they were going to have a fish fry or something. And he would spray, he had a puffer can, 
and he would spray DDT around the yard and in the bushes, and there were no bugs. I mean, it really worked, but it really worked a problem on other it, things, too. It really worked. <laughs> yes. All right, yeah. so moving along, uh, is the caterpillar up, Paul? No, do you want the caterpillar up? Yeah, caterpillar put the caterpillar. Okay. Caterpillar. Caterpillar. Cater. Is there any cats caterpillar. involved? Uh -huh. There we go. Okay. I have no idea what it is. Green. This was, I took this <laughs> with, with Camp on Memorial Day weekend at Mountain View, Arkansas, and we were hiking, well, walking, from the campground to the restaurant at the Ozark, uh, what's it called, uh, state park there, a uh, place to dedicate to reserve to preserving the mountain ways. And anyway, uh, we were walking along, and I saw this caterpillar and took, I don't know, a couple of dozen pictures, and this is the one I like the best. Uh, you know, it's amazing what you can do with a smartphone, just holding it down and, and saying, okay, having my wife, now they said, tap right on this, you know, in the middle of its back, and then take a and tap, take pictures. You end up with a really cool picture. So we went and ate. We were there about 45 minutes, and we came back, and the caterpillar had made it um, about, I don't know, 30 to 45 feet, uh, just walking right down the hiking trail. I guess it was easy crawling for it. But in, you know, it was maybe going a foot a minute uh, or maybe a little bit less. But uh, I thought this was a cool picture uh, to end on. It will become a flying thing one day. I just didn't have time to research and figure out exactly what this will turn in, what kind of moth or butterfly it will turn into. It won't turn into a bird. No, it won't. <laughs> no, it won't. That would be weird if the birds did that. Uh, if, if birds did that, it'd be normal because just birds yeah, do that. Yeah, right. It'd be normal. But the whole transformation is weird. That amazing that it can go from that to a butterfly yeah. or a beautiful moth. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So, Anyhow. comment, Scott? Uh, Pekka uh, mentioned that he did send over some, he emailed in some. Uh, uh, coot, I think some coot pictures. So uh, you should have those in your inbox by now, Kent. So okay, awesome. all right. And yeah, Scott. That last week there were a couple of people that said they had emailed foes, and we hadn't used them. And I haven't seen them. I hmm. still have not seen them. They haven't shown hmm. up in my email or in the Explore Alliance. So I'm going to go back and listen to last week's show and make sure who they were. But if you sent me picture, I need to send you, I need you to send us in the same email account, yeah. hey, I sent some pictures. So we make sure that goes through, it might and then be, we can start working on what's going on. It right. might be very advantageous to send them to paul.newton at explorescientific.com uh, as well. Here, here's what I think is going on. Uh, I think the pictures, if they're sending four or five, may be so big our email server oh, is yeah, bouncing them. Off the, so yeah, so them we off. use a service called wetransfer.com. And Scott, put that in the uh, uh, chat sure. function. <laughs> Excuse me. I hope I didn't blow yours out. Man. So wetransfer.com is a free service. You just go to it. Say, I want to send stuff. There's a button. I, th I think it actually says that. Yeah, it's absolutely it, free. Yeah. You put in the, Up to the person you're gigabytes. sending it to, and you put in your email address. It's going to send you a verifica verifica verification <laughs> code that uh, you're going to put back into the system. And then it's going to go, Paul says it's up to two gigabytes of, of information. Uh, the PowerPoint we're using today was so big, 87 megabytes, I could not send it to Paul, intercompany even. So I, we transferred it to his email so we could make this presentation today. But, yeah, so if you sent me something and we haven't acknowledged you, thanks a lot. What, what kind of birds are they? Where did you take them? Questions like that. That's a good indicator that we, we haven't seen it. And so I'm thinking that the file was maybe so big that it's causing them to not go through. And what's weird is 
they don't bounce back either. It just just doesn't if, send them or something. So if you have a, a Google account, you can upload it to the free service, which is Google Docs, and then you can send us the link that way, and we can download them as well. Yeah, yeah. There's multiple ways, but if you send them, and we haven't used them, and we haven't said I haven't said thank you, then I don't have them. So send them again. But I'm going to have to watch the show from last week. I think it was my Vera Oker. Oh, I can't. Michael Overacker <laughs> and uh, somebody else I can't remember. Boy, some words are hard to, pro hard to pronounce when you hear them in your ears about a third of a second after you, <laughs> you say it. You and audio it is just tough. going around and around and around, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, Scott, you got some comments? Uh, no, I think that's about it. Everybody's saying thank you. And um, yeah, don't uh, forget to send them to me as well. And that way I can make sure they're on the show. And any videos. Paul, I'll start, I'll start forwarding them to you. Yeah, yeah you that's know. easier. That's, that's easier. easier. Don't they, they don't need to send it. Yeah. All right. Well, Just send them to Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. Yeah. I put that link in there and you're good to go. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's our show for today. All right. So let's crawl off like this little caterpillar and get on with our lives. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Are we out? Thank you. Yep, Good we're night. out. Thank you.